Hi, Year 12. Uh, this is the last lesson on <coughs> the ontological argument, and it's about essay writing. <coughs> I don't want you to write an essay um, for now, but I want to go through how I plan an essay, and what I want you to do is, is basically use my notes and the things I'm going to say to produce like a an outline of an essay, what you would write if an essay came up. Now, with the ontological argument, often the difficult thing that difficulty that people have had sometimes is that recognizing and understanding the question. So I've put down three questions here, you know, the sort of things that could come up. So first one, to what extent is the ontological argument successful in proving the existence of God? That's a nice, easy question. I mean, not it's not easy, but it's an easy one to recognize because it just basically says, does the ontological argument prove that God exists? Second one, we cannot derive the existence of God from his definition. Because the ontological argument is the only argument which tries to argue that God must exist by definition, um, this question is just basically about the ontological argument. It's basically saying the ontological argument says we can derive God's existence. In other words, we can work out that God exists from the definition of God. So it's again, really, it's just asking you, does the ontological argument work? Existence cannot be a defining characteristic of God. That's looking at Kant's criticism. But again, it's only um, it's really very similar again, because it's only the ontological argument that says that existence is a defining characteristic of God. So it's basically asking you, is the ontological argument correct? So, yeah, you've got to kind of be aware of the, the key terminology surrounding this argument to, and think about how that could be asked. One thing I should say, you you could get an argument, uh, uh, an essay which was kind of saying, comparing which is better which gives you better proof of the existence of god inductive arguments or deductive arguments so this is the only deductive argument that you use the ontological argument but then you've got like cosmological teleological and um and the religious experiences they are all inductive arguments you use evidence to suggest god's existence so we're, that's something I want to look at another time probably when we're back in classes to look at how you might compare and contrast those things Okay, let's move on then. Right, so this is the essay that I want to look at. So I just want you to put this as your title. We cannot derive the existence of God from his definition. Obviously, it's a 40 mark question, like they all are. I'll just go through what I do in the introduction. I'm not going there's not gonna be a lot written on the screen here. I just put the 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 acronym down to, in order to um uh kind of just as a guide for, for what I'm gonna say. Sorry, I'm drinking a cup of tea, so I'll keep uh, keep being interrupted. Um, so yeah, what do you need to what do you need to put in your introduction? Well, you need to basically in your definitions explain that you know what this statement is all about. Really, you want to say, well, this is um, when it says we cannot derive God from his definition. It's talking about the ontological argument because the ontological argument basically claims that statements such as God exists. Are analytic statements because it's part of the definition of God that he exists. So you just want to show that you know this is asking about the ontological argument. The implications, well, if uh, if we can derive the existence of God from his definition, that must mean God definitely exists because that's one thing about the ontological argument. And if it works, it doesn't suggest there might be a God or there's a probability there's a God. It tells us that there definitely is a God. Um, so it's basically the, the, the implications of this question are does the ontological argument work, and therefore, is there good? Is it a good reason to believe in a god? Scholars, well, of course, Anselm. Uh, I'm going to look in my essay: Anselm, Aquinas, Guinillo, and Kant. You could look at Descartes. I'll talk. I'll, we'll talk about uh, how I'm going to structure things, but you could definitely look at Descartes. Uh, and then the conclusion: Well, I'm going to go with to back Kant and to say that the statement is uh, is correct because existence cannot be a predicate. In other words, existence cannot be part of the definition of who God is. Okay, we're going to do three perils. First peril. So I've said here, we go. We start with Anselm's first argument. So I'd say Anselm's, Anselm's first argument shows that he would disagree with the statement. Why would that? Well, this is first um, part argument. Oh, I'm going to go through this quite quickly. Um, but I want you to make notes and basically draw the outline that I'm talking about here in your notes. But, you know, I'm going to go through it quickly because we've been, I've been through this material already in other videos. Um, yeah. So wh why would Anselm disagree with the statement from his first argument? Well, first of all, we'd just say, well, this is in Proslogion. 
of chapter 2, and you just go through the argument. God is divine as something than which nothing greater can be thought. Existence is greater than non-existence, therefore God must exist, therefore we can think of something greater. So he's basically saying that um, because of God's definition is something than which nothing greater can be thought, therefore God must exist, because otherwise it leads to this contradiction where we can think of something greater than God. So he's basically saying, yeah, the definition of God means that he must exist, which is exactly what the statement is talking about. So he's saying we can derive the existence of God from his definition. Where are we going to go in response? Well, obviously, there's lots of responses that we can look at in, in detail, but I want to go for the first peril. I want to respond with Aquinas because I think that's quite a short one, quite a neat one to start with. So Aquinas says that as God is transcendent, we cannot know what the definition of God is. Therefore, the argument might work for God, who knows his definition, but it doesn't work for us. Um, and so that's been my response. God's transcendent, therefore we cannot know his definition exactly. Therefore we cannot say that God's definition is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Therefore we cannot derive his existence from his definition. How am I going to evaluate this? Well, I'd say arguably, um, uh, arguably I'd argue with Anselm here. I would say actually, we can arguably, Anselm's definition is pretty good. Uh, we don't have to, we can agree that God is the greater, the being great, uh, is something which nothing greater can be conceived without making God not transcendent. We can just say he is this, but he's also, we can't actually know completely what he is because he's unknowable. So I don't think Aquinas disproves uh, Anselm's argument. Yes, God is transcendent, but that doesn't mean that's not a good definition of God. Okay, peril two, this is when we come down to Guanillo. Guanillo proves, provides an argument against the statement in his book, In Behalf of the Fool. So that's what his book's called. And that's where he shows about the island. He's basically saying, look, Guanillo's point is, if we link it to the statement, we cannot derive the existence of God from his definition. His point is, we know that we cannot ex derive the existence of an island from its definition. Um, and therefore, if the argument doesn't work for an island, it mustn't work for God. So um, so that's what I'd explain his whole argument. He would say, imagine an island than which no greater island can be conceived. Existence is better than non-existence. Therefore, that island must exist. Otherwise, we could we could imagine a, a greater island. And so he's, he's directly going against, uh, going with the statement there, saying, look, we cannot, if we can't derive the island's existence from uh, its definition, then we can't do the same, we, neither can we do it for God, because it's the same logic. Now, you've got an option there. You can then go for the criticism provided by um, uh, um, John Hick and also by Alvin Plantinga, the idea that the concept of an, uh, of a, of a, an island than which nothing great can be conceived is incoherent, because you could always make an island better by adding things to that island. So the, that's why you'd say, well, it doesn't work for an island because you can't actually provide the, that definition of an island. There's no such thing as a perfect island, whereas God is a perfect being and there is such a thing as a perfect being. So you could say that, and that would be a good criticism of Guanillo. Maybe better would be to show that you understand Anselm a bit more by saying, well, Anselm's reply was using his second formulation found in Proslogy on chapter three. In his in this version, it says that if God is something than which nothing greater can be thought, then not only must exist, but he must be the kind of being who cannot be thought to not exist. Um, this makes God distinct from contingent things such as island. An island, any island that we can think of may exist or may not exist. It cannot exist by definition. In contrast, and some argues, God is the only thing that cannot be thought not to exist. Therefore, an island's existence cannot be derived from its definition, but God's existence can be derived from his definition. I hope that makes sense. Uh, so I would say is my conclusion there, my evaluation, sorry, is that, uh, that in this case, um, Guanillo is wrong in as much as um, he hasn't disproved Anselm because Anselm has got quite a, a good argument against him. His argument seems uh, logically... Uh, it seems to overcome the logical problem that Guinillo presents. 
That doesn't, of course, mean, and you have to do this when you're linking, because, because in both of these perils, I've argued with Ansel. But in my last peril, I'm going to say why I think Ansel was wrong. So in my link, I, I would probably say something like, you know, therefore, Guanillo has not proved that um, Anselm, Anselm's argument is flawed. However, a more devastating criticism of his his theory is provided by Immanuel Kant. So I'm not saying, when I say, when I'm siding with Anselm on this peril, I'm not saying that um, Anselm is correct. I'm saying that Guanillo's criticism is not effective. I hope that makes sense. Okay, last one, Kant. So Kant provides the most convincing argument against the statement when he argues that existence is not a predicate. And you've just really got to talk through what that means, existence not being a predicate. So a predicate is a defining characteristic of a thing. Kant argues that existence can never make up the defining characteristic of a thing. The question of existence is about whether there is such an object in reality, not what the essence of this object is. Now, Kant was responding to Descartes. Good to mention Descartes. Yeah. My chair's just collapsed. Hold on, let me get another chair. That's not good. Um, right. Got another chair. Um, so, um, uh, Kant was talking about Descartes uh, because he, because Descartes was saying God pre pre uh, pre uh, possesses all perfections and therefore existence is one of his uh, predicates, one of his defining characteristics. However, it can all should be applied to Anselm. Anselm's argument is based on the idea that God must have existence as a defining predicate because otherwise we could think of something greater. So that's how, that. The whole of Anselm's argument is based on that thing. God, it must be part of who God is that He exists. If that's not true, then we could think of something greater. But the point is, the point that Kant's trying to make is that existence is not a predicate, and therefore, if we take the two things that Anselm wants to think about, um, a, a God that doesn't exist and the God that does exist, when we think of them in our minds, they're exactly the same. It's not one is not greater than the other. So there's so he's he has basically shown uh, Kant that yeah you can't define God into existence because existence cannot be the definition of something. I hope that makes sense. But go back to the Kant video if, you, if you're not sure because it's it's a tricky concept. Okay, response. I'd go with Charles Hartshorn. Uh, he challenges Kant by arguing that existence can be viewed as a predicate. A, uh, a predicate. He argues that, for example, the concept of pain is very different from really experiencing pain, and therefore that existence does add something to the essence of something. Uh, that's his argument. Again, go back to the camp video if you're not sure. My evaluation would be that Hartshorn is wrong. Experiencing pain is different from thinking about the concept, but existence does not add to the essence of the concept. It simply says that the concept is really present in reality rather than just present in the mind. Therefore, and this would be, you know, I'm not going to do a conclusion, but this would be my overall conclusion. Although um, uh, uh, Anselm survives criticisms from Aquinas and from Guanillo, ultimately, Kant provides the key for explaining why the argument is wrong and, and why, that we, why we cannot derive the existence of God from his definition. Because Anselm, like Descartes, the whole argument is based on the idea that be, the fact that he must exist is part of the definition of God, and therefore God must exist. That would make God exists into a, an uh, analytic statement. It's true by definition. But what Kant is saying is that existence cannot be part of the definition of anything, whatever it is, be it an island or God or anything. And therefore, if existence can't be the definition of anything, we cannot derive the existence of something just from its definition. The only way he says that we can work out if something exists is th in inductively. That means through evidence, looking at evidence from the world outside. So uh, Kant is showing here that, yeah, you can't derive the existence of God from his definition. You can only derive existence from evidence that points towards him being there. I hope that makes sense. See what you can do with that. I think, it, you know, like I say, all of the um, arguments uh all the things i've explained in terms of arguments are in on the videos we've all, i've already put up it's just a question of making sure you've got the structure of the essay okay thanks